Greetings, Renaissance scholars. Here we are with our Unit 1 review for Renaissance Nation States and Exploration. I'm going down the review sheet here, and we'll start with the Renaissance, which refers to the rebirth of classical learning. It's looking back to the uh, work, the art, the writing, the poetry of the Greeks and the Romans, and this is following the fall of Constantinople in 1450. And the Renaissance starts in Italy for various reasons, which we'll cover in a few minutes. Humanism is the glorification of uh, human beings, their ability, their potential, their reason, their physical beauty. And um, the humanities are the studies of those things that refer to human beings, uh, the philosophy and art and music and literature and speech. Um, know these artists and their works and how they display humanist values. And just a comment here on new art techniques. You've got chiaroscuro, which is the play of light and darkness using shadow to show perspective. Contraposto, or contraposto, which is weight shift, which shows um, you know, the accurate standing of, of people rather than being a little stiff. And perspective or vanishing point showing in a two-dimensional space um, objects growing smaller in the distance. Michelangelo, uh, the creation of Adam is probably the most um, well-known piece of the larger Sistine Chapel, and the David is this famous statue that's, oh, close to three times life-size, and, you know, there's this naked um, Adonis of a man, and Adonis is a, 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 Greek, a Greek character here, and David is showing you a biblical character, but he's showing you the beauty of the human form, this idealization of a human being with these uh, very remarkably um, oversized hands representing the potential of, of human beings. Donatello's David is quite different. It's a skitty, skitty, skinny adolescent David, and he's straddling the severed head of Goliath, which he's just lopped off with his, his axe. And the point here with the skinny David here is this is much more like an adolescent little boy. He's the youngest of all the brothers, if you remember the biblical story. And there's this realism, this realism both in the beauty of this super big, um, this powerful uh, Michelangelo David, and there's also realism in this, uh, this adolescent Donatello David. But let um, Botticelli's Primavera, these are these women dancing in these very diaphanous gowns, and it shows interest in pagan themes. This is a, a pagan sort of dance party in the woods. Da Vinci's Last Supper, biblical theme, but it's showing perspective here. It's showing um, vanishing point behind it, and all the characters are lined up in a, in a perspective ratio. Jan van Eyck, the Arnolfini Wedding. This is famous for its fine detail, its use of perspective. It's a portrait of a prosperous middle-class couple in the Netherlands, and it probably used camera obscura, this use of mirrors. Piero della Francesca, the Duke and Duchess of Urbino. Um, this is, a, again, a very realistic portraiture, and if you look at the Duke here, um, he's not a particularly handsome man. He's got perhaps a broken nose. It's this kind of hawkish, um, bent nose, and it's painted realistically. This is how the guy looked. And portrait art was something that the wealthy did to, um, you know, to show some ostentation, to sh show some social status. Raphael's School of Athens, who's in this painting? This is a painting which very much represents the values of the Renaissance. This has been used in an essay question, um, comparing it with Picasso and, you know, the sort of the broken humanity of Picasso compared with these, um, these pillars of, of reason and learning. You've got Athena, the goddess of wisdom, in the audience upper right-hand corner of the painting. Right in the center stage, you've got Plato and Aristotle, two of the most famous of the Greek philosophers. You've got Pythagoras, you've got Euclid. Um, you might even have Michelangelo in this painting. This is a painting sort of glorifying the human mind and human uh, mental potential. Filippo Brunelleschi did the Cathedral of Maria del Fiore, which is called the Duomo or the Florence Cathedral, in which he adopted Roman engineering. And he, uh, uh, actually it's Renaissance engineering, but he adopted this Roman pantheon, this, this dome on this temple that's very famous in Rome. Important Renaissance women. Uh, most women were illiterate and poor. And well-to-do girls did study the classics. They learned how to play musical instruments. 
and wealthy women were patrons very often of the arts. And if you were the wife of a wealthy uh, middle class or aristocratic um, husband, you were supposed to have sort of a cultured household. You were supposed to be able to carry on a conversation. You were to be knowledgeable about poetry and maybe play some music yourself along with your daughters. And two women that are in your book that you should be aware of, Christine de Pizan, who wrote uh, sort of a feminist history is what your book says, but um, Christine de Pizan is this woman who was married at 15 and she was widowed at 25. And as a widow, she had to support her mother, two children, and a niece. And she wrote poetry and she wrote some history and she wrote some commentary on mythology and um, on, on rhetoric and, and, and learning. And she was just a very well-versed woman of the time. Isabel Deste, D apostrophe E-S-T-E, was married to the ruler of Mantua, and she's a very famous patroness of the arts. Where did the wealth from the Renaissance come from? Well, in Italy, it came from Mediterranean trade, and up farther uh, north, the Northern Renaissance wealth came from trade along the North Sea, along the what would be the Dutch and the German coasts. And the Hansa, or the Hanseatic League, is this loose confederation of cities that are prospering from the trade that's coming down from Russia and from uh, Scandinavia and going along the coast of the Netherlands and would be Belgium and uh, Germany and on to England and, and farther south. Um, where was the Renaissance located? Primarily in Italy and in what's called the low, the low countries. That would primarily be the Netherlands for our purposes. Differences between Italian and Northern Renaissance. The Northern Renaissance was more religious. They looked to Greek um, the, the original Greek transcripts, the Greek manuscripts that the New Testament comes from, and they looked to the early Greek fathers for the purpose of purifying the church for a more holy faith. The Italians were much more interested in pagan themes for pagan themes' sake. Um, and it is the Northern Renaissance that will give us Desiderius Erasmus, famous, famous critic of the Catholic Church, and it said that Desiderius Erasmus um, um, laid the egg which Luther hatched, and Luther is this northern European who will be further criticized the church to a point of uh, reformation and breaking with Rome. And that's coming up the next unit. Niccolo Machiavelli, the prince, this is a gift to the Medici ruler on how to govern, govern effectively, and in it it's rather striking. He makes no reference to Christian morality. He's got this famous quote, it's better to be feared than loved, and the advocates being strong as a lion and sly as a fox, and doing what you need to do, doing what is pragmatic, for and the, the, the end justifies the means. If you have to be temporarily brutal, if you have to be ruthless, if you have to lie and use deceit, if this holds the state together, if this keeps the peace, if it stops anarchy, this is justified, according to Machiavelli. Thomas More is uh, later on in the, in the Reformation, he's a famous opponent of Henry VIII when he breaks off from the church, and he'll be executed as a Catholic martyr loyal to the church. But in this unit here, he's the famous author of Utopia, and he's an English Renaissance writer who's writing about this ideal uh, state, this ideal government, uh, which promotes a certain amount of equality among the aristocracy, at least, and promotes education, pr promotes learning. And, um, and it lowers the importance of, of wealth and, and what he would see as greed. Desiderius Erasmus, The Praise of Folly, this is, he's probably the most famous of all the Renaissance writers. He was uh, translated across Europe. The Praise of Folly is a criticism of corruption in the Catholic Church. Pico de Mirandola, we've talked about him from day one here, Oration on the Dignity of Man. He is exalting, glorifying the potential of man. God has made us, and we are to, um, to, to revel in this God-given potential to learn and to, to excel. Uh, how did new monarchies become united? Well, Spain was united by marriage between um, Isabel of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. France, Joan of Arc, drove the British out of of France, ending the Hundred Years' War. England had a civil war between the House of Lancaster and the House of York, and the House of Lancaster won, and you have Henry Tudor takes the, the throne. 
How did new monarchies maintain unity? Spain pursued religious conformity by um, reestablishing the Catholic Church after defeating the Moors. And basically, if you were a Moor defeated, if you were Muslim or if you were Jewish, you had three choices. You could leave, you could convert, or you could die. So religious conformity um, helped cement the modern uh, reestablishment of Spain as an independent nation state. England had the Star Chamber, this um, court which um, the king ran, which there was no appeal to, and the uh, king basically disarmed the private armies of um, lesser lords. How was Spain united? Again, this marriage between Isabel and Ferdinand, and what happened in 1492, the three things are the Moors were defeated at the Battle of Granada, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, discovered America, and the Jews were expelled, um, probably somewhere 200,000, quarter million of them, famous expulsion of the Jews. How did new technology influence overseas exploration? You have what's called the Caravel. It's this ship with a, a movable uh, boom, a very, um, a very fast, very sleek ship that could sail well. You had a school of cartography set up by Prince Henry, the navigator who was the king of Portugal. The Portuguese are first out of the gate in trying to do an end run around the Italians who control the Mediterranean. And you have these devices which would tell you where on the earth you were by looking at the stars, the astrolabe, the sextant, the quadrant, and the compass, which had been around for a while. Ultimately, it was borrowed from the Chinese. Um, why were Spain and Portugal leaders in overseas exploration? Well, they're on the Iberian Peninsula, which juts out into the Atlantic Ocean. Remember, the Venetians slash Italians and the Muslims had this lock on trade in the Mediterranean. And the Portuguese are trying to, they're, they're slowly making their way around Africa. And it's the Portuguese that make their way around South Africa, would be the Cape, uh, Cape Horn, and on to India. And the Portuguese will explore in the other direction, but the Spanish will, will go the other direction first. And it's uh, Columbus that will explore the Bahamas and what would be Haiti and Hispaniola and Cuba and the coast of Venezuela in his four trips to uh, North America. The Columbian Exchange is this exchange of flora and fauna between the new and the old world. And uh, as far as human beings go, you have white Europeans coming to America. And once the Indians die out from uh, either massacre and murder and you know overwork and being enslaved and finally disease, they're going to be replaced by black Africans. And about 90% of these black Africans will pour into the Caribbean and into Brazil primarily to grow sugar. You have, uh, as far as animals, the Indians didn't have very many large, didn't have any large bees. So you're going to get horses, you're going to get cows, you're going to get sheep, you're going to get pigs, you're going to get chickens, you're going to get these um, uh, beasts and fowl coming over. And as far as vegetables, look in your notes here for some detail. Um, you do have coming over to the New World, you have citrus, you have wheat, you have oats and barley, you have, um, going in the other direction, you have corn, you have potatoes, you have cocoa, um, and you have uh, tomatoes. Coming in the other direction of the New World, you have uh, pitted fruits like cherries and European strains of apples. So you have this, um, this exchange of, of life, of people, of animals, and plants. Um, and also on the test, it's not in the review sheet, but you should know Baldassar Castiglione and his book, The Courtier, and he writes about, it's called civic humanism. This is the idea that those who serve a ruler, such as the Medici's, should be cultured, they should be well-rounded, they should be educated. Um, simply put, they should be Renaissance men. They should be able to sing, they should be able to dance, they should be able to play music, they should be able to recite poetry, they should be very literate, they should be able to speak different languages, and they should be strong, they should be able to wield a sword and a shield, they should be militarily adept, and um, they should be, um, you know, that you had have the equivalent of gym class for people who would be courtiers and who would be serving in court or hoping to serve a ruler. So Baldassar Castiglione is describing this ideal man that perhaps is the person that is being uh, exalted and promoted in Pico de Mirandola's oration on the dignity of man. Well, there you have it. And if you've got any questions, come find me before the test. If you can, otherwise study hard. Um, I'm assuming you have read the book carefully, that you have looked at a review book, that you've read your notes, that you've looked at this, and you know, certainly free, feel free to um, do further study 
as you can. So signing off, sayonara.